Welcome back to the channel. Today we have a new build. It's a 2017 GMC Sierra Denali. Four wheel drive with a big 6.2. So let's get it down to the shop and get it unloaded and take a look at it. So our truck was listed as a run and drive, and I did for a brief moment think about flying down to Austin, Texas and driving it back. And I remembered, I don't like flying. And I could have done it because, well, it started right up. Battery is fully charged. It didn't have much gas in it, but still could have made it to the gas station. But then we would miss our trailer unloading sequence. probably wondering where the damage is. Well, you and me both. Uh, it's actually a theft recovery with a clear title. It was total. It's one of those clear title total losses that don't exist. Number, I don't know what number, but apparently the internet at this point is wrong. So uh, we got a lock that was punched out. We're gonna have to fix that. Uh, we have a broken window, not from the theft recovery, but because, well, this truck came from Texas. And Everything I buy in Texas has a broken window. But I did have that one person that explained to me why that is. It appears that in other states, uh, they replace the windows for free. And in Texas, they don't. You have to pay for your own window. I just have to wonder where those other states are that they replace your windows for free. Because it isn't this one. Let's take a look at the rest of it. A little damage on the bumper there. That's courtesy of the auction. I guess they didn't think it had enough damage for me. so. I got a bumper to repair or replace. Probably replace, it's not that expensive. All the fancy plastic chrome is still good, so it's just the actual metal bumper. Now this thing is fully loaded. It's got the power running boards, even it has the DVD player. With a remote. We have some aftermarket floor mats. Not sure where this goes. I'm pretty sure they checked every single box for options. The only thing it's missing are the bigger wheels, which I think it's supposed to have. We'll have to check the RPO codes. Uh, so it is supposed to have the bigger 22s on it. The tire tag in the door says so. These are only 20s. So this thing literally had every single option including a rotted pumpkin. We got our tie downs. All four of them, what a deal. So we're gonna try our key in our driver's door lock that they punched out, Let's see if it works. Let's open it up and see, it does not. Also doesn't work in the tailgate, but they did not punch out. Try the lock for the spare tire. No. Love box. So this key works the ignition, but it doesn't seem to work any other lock. So I'm wondering if they change the ignition. I think I'm going to have to call GM and get a different key, get the actual key made for this truck and see if it's got a different cut. I'd be willing to bet it does. So that they just changed the ignition lock and reprogrammed it. Let's go ahead and relearn all these tire sensors. So I suspect that they threw these wheels on here sometime after they stole it. Maybe they took the other wheels off and sold them. I have no idea. So even though these aren't the right wheels for the truck, the tires are almost brand new. These are Denali wheels, just not the highest level and the tire sensors are in there. So let's program them to the truck and see if we can get rid of one light on the dash. All of our sensors are reading now. That's one less light on the dash. So while I was picking it up in Texas, I decided to fill it up with gas because it was almost two bucks a gallon cheaper than it is here at home. So I don't took almost 30 gallons of gas, two bucks a gallon, you do the math. It saved quite a bit. So now at least I got some gas to use. Let's clean it out and see if we can Put our story together, how we ended up with this thing.
Yeah, I don't think this is going to fit me. Took the RPO tags off. Stickers. That's actually carbon fiber vinyl wrap. And we're going to find out that's not the only carbon fiber vinyl wrap on this vehicle. I'm not just throwing all this stuff on the floor. There is a garbage can just out of frame. So clean freaks, don't come for me. 30 day tag, expired in February. Title application receipt, 1622. They didn't have it for very long. 11022. I got an oil change. What a deal, it's 500 miles to go. Don't have to change oil right away. Drive it around a little bit. Too much to read. Registration. Maybe I'll call the old owner and see what the story was. Got a lock. File. This job looks pretty easy so as not to rob you of your game. Let's find out. Goo gone. Some napkins. Oh, lunch. Crackers. Rick. Rag. Eh, that looks like it. Nothing in here. Hmm. Guess they didn't work on it that many extra bolts. More haters' tears. Ha! I'll have those when I'm done. Ah, we got a set of Texas plates. Wonder if they're even registered to this. They've never even been on. That's it. Somebody cleaned it up. All right, Halloween's over. Time to get rid of our pumpkin. Bear watch. I actually picked this truck up before Halloween, so I'm not sure what the pumpkin was hanging out in there for. We get the big stuff. We don't want to scare off the detailing gnome. The detailing gnome gets the rest. So these power running boards, they're kind of cool. Not because of that, they all do that. But if you're a midget like me, they go to the back so that you can reach into the bed. Instead of down here, I can't touch the bottom. So, helps you find more stuff. So it's not often that we have to take the vehicle for a ride to figure out what we need to do to it, but that's exactly the case here. We got a broken windshield and a bumper, we know that, no big deal. But we want to see what it needs mechanically. And although the video doesn't show it quite that well, the front struts are completely, I'm thinking locked up, because it rides like, well, the wheels are welded directly to the frame. And it has a very bad shutter whenever it shifts. And since it's an eight speed transmission, it shifts a lot. I don't know how they were driving like that. Once you're at cruising speed, it's fine, but it shutters like crazy. It shakes the dash. The camera couldn't quite catch it, but it's pretty violent. I'm not sure if we're gonna need a trans. Um, I remember from back in my old days, Ford had many issues with torque converter shutters and you could fix it just by flushing out the trans fluid. So maybe we'll give that a try on this thing and see what happens before we go throwing a transmission at it because these eight speeds are not cheap.
So we'll head back to the shop and take a better look at it once it's up on the lift. This is my first time driving it, so you get to go along with me. So I believe my hypothesis was correct and these struts are junk because all the magic bouncy fluid has now leaked out. So they need replacement whether or not they are the actual problem. Unfortunately, they are the Magnaride struts, so they are not cheap, and they did buy brand new ones from GM. We'll unbolt them from the control arms. The six inch long bolts in there. Now we can reach in from the top. We'll disconnect the wire to our struts. Yeah, struts with electrical connectors. Technology is great. And we'll pull our connector off of our wiring harness. It's just clipped on. Now we can unbolt the struts from our frame. Just three nuts on the top. And now we can wiggle it out of there. Drop it down and then lift it out. Now over to the spring compressor. We need to take this electrical connector off, we need to save it because I forget what these prices are. I didn't want to remember that traumatic event of having to pay for them, so I blocked it out of my memory. But it didn't come with the electrical connector. It just came with some pins at the end. And I left my little pin remover at home, so we went to Staples and got one. They sell them in boxes of like 500. When the connector's off, and pull our plastic off of there. So we have our strut assembly mounted up to our pinwheel of death. So we're going to compress the spring and pray. I feel like being daring today. Look away, safety experts. There's no safe way to do this. Rethinking my career choices. Guess we'll go a little bit more. And that looks like about enough. It doesn't spin. I'm guessing that somebody was, uh, I don't know, maybe running from the cops with the stolen truck. I mean, maybe they were just driving it like they stole it, but they must have had some hard landings with this thing and they bent these struts. They are completely locked up. They don't move at all. So it makes this part of the job a little more difficult. And normally I would just spin the nut off the top and launch them across the shop, but I kind of want to put it all back together the way I found it. And I don't know what's inside these. So we're going to spin the nut off the top. And because it has that wire protruding out of the top of it, we can't just throw a socket on there and spin it off with an impact. We have to do this with a wrench, the caveman way. We'll spin the nut off the top. Slowly but surely. Probably could have used the ratcheting side of the wrench. Yeah, I'm new here. And our strut usually falls out, but not in this case. We had to take a little tension off of it and it dropped out of there. I win. So now we'll route the wires up through our strut mount. Reaching up inside that boot is not the easiest. And the camera died because it got tired of waiting for me. So we just stuffed the strut up in there, put the nut back on. Now we can reassemble all of our electrical connectors. I don't know that it matters where these pins go, but I did mark them, so I put them back in the same spot. Again, GM, I paid all this money for this strut. Why couldn't you give me a new connector? Put our little lock in there. Use our special staples tool. Flip it down in there. And then we'll put the little keeper on the back of it. Holds the split loom to our plug. Put that in. Now we'll put our 
factory zip tie back on there. We're going to use yellow just to mess with everyone because the original one was black. I know it's not OE, but I don't care. We'll tighten our zip tie to manufacturer specs and clip off the excess. Now our strut is fully assembled, we can throw it back in the truck. All the experts are losing their mind now because it has a yellow zip tie on it. And that makes me happy. Now we'll clock it in the right position here, stuff it up in the frame. Then we'll set it up on the control arm. Throw a couple nuts on the top so it doesn't land on the floor or our feet. Because I forgot to wear my steel toed flip flops today. So now I'll tighten up the nuts at the top. Tighten down the factory Ugga Duggas. We can clip in our wiring harness. And clip that back into the other wiring harness. We'll tighten up the bolts on the bottom of the strut. The battery doesn't go dead on our impact. We run in the extra four inches of bolt. We can unbolt the top of our strut and our passenger side. This one's a little harder to get to, there's more obstructions. We did the easy side first. We can disconnect our wire. Pry the strut out of there. This thing is stuck. I win. Didn't quite make it to the floor. I almost wish it had. We'll weasel it back out of here. Now I win. We'll cut off our zip tie with the dullest razor blade I could find in the shop. Then we'll start unclipping all of our little plastic caps. Part of our electrical connector. Back to our special staples tool. I just bent the end of the paper clip over to reach in and grab the little tabs. Whatever works. You can pull the keeper out of there, and then just push the pins out. And then over to the pinwheel of death to change this one over. This one seems to be locked up a little bit worse than the other one. So maybe that'll help us, or maybe it'll hurt us taking this apart. Seems like it came out a little easier. Let's hope it goes back together the same way. Change over all of our parts. Still can't believe the price of these struts. And it's not worth going with aftermarkets. I have had problems with aftermarket ones. Then you gotta do this job again. Not that much fun the first time. Feed our wires back up through there. And then we'll put our nut on there and bring it down. And once the nut's on there, we can breathe a sigh of relief that we survived this strut replacement. The worst that could happen now is you lose some fingers. We got some extras, not a big deal. We're going to try to clock it in the right position so we don't have to spin it once it's in there. And then we'll release our tension off of our spring compressor, also known as the pinwheel of death. At least this one's mounted to a wall. You don't know fear until you've done this on the floor. Come on out of there. Then we'll put our electrical connector back together. 
little piece on the top of our strut. And we'll put our zip tie on. Oh, with a black zip tie on this side. We'll put our wires back in. We did mark this plug too, so they are back in the same spot. Again, I don't know if it matters, but I don't want to find out the hard way that it does. Put our little safety in there. Push it in with a pick. I think I lost my special staples tool. Now we'll set our strut back in there. Drop it past the lower control arm. And stuff it up in the frame. Then we can set it back on top of our control arm to hold it in place. Tighten down the nuts at the top. And connect all our wiring harness. Plug it in. And then we'll tighten up the two bolts at the bottom to hold our strut to the control arm. And hopefully it rides a lot better. Now you may not be able to tell from the video, but the camera does shake a little bit more because the front end actually moves. It rides a lot better, but we still have our whole shifting issue to take care of. One problem at a time. We need to figure out where we're going to be spending our money on this thing. We don't want to spend it all in the one spot. We've got roughly $700 worth of struts in it. Now we're going to try just the trans fluid chain. The trans fluid's pretty black, so maybe there is some hope. Of course, they didn't put a drain plug in there because, well, engineers hate mechanics. So we'll unbolt the pan and make a huge mess. Hope we have a floor cleaning gnome. And as if engineers didn't make our life difficult enough without putting a drain plug in the bottom of this pan, they decided to put an exhaust crossover pipe right underneath the trans pan uh, and give the illusion that we could get the trans pan out of there, but we can't. It's kind of wedged in there. So rather than taking it off, we're just going to pry it down. We can pry against the frame. We need about a quarter of an inch to slip it out of there. So we got it. Now we cleaned it all out, cleaned all the magic metallic fuzzy stuff off the magnets. The fluid was pretty dark. Now we're going to slide it back up there. We're going to reuse the old gasket. This is only temporary. We're just going to put it all back together, fill it back up with fluid, take it for a ride and see how it does. So our shadow gnome has given us a hand. He was holding the gasket up there. It fell off about 15 seconds before I put the pan back up. Drop it through the pan on the gasket like this. We'll line up the tabs in the pan. Did you get it? And then we'll stuff the pan back up there. We zip all our bolts back in there. Tighten them down to manufacturer specs with our driver that identifies as a torque wrench. So we changed just the trans fluid and drove it around and it got rid of about 80% of our little torque converter shutter. So we did it one more time, just changed the trans fluid and it's 100% gone now. Everything is fine. So now we're going to throw a new trans filter in there, new fluid, new pan gasket, and that'll be the last time we're in there for a little while. But before we do those, we're waiting for our parts to come for that. We're going to throw some other parts on this thing. So let's get to it. So usually the mechanical stuff goes at the end of our rebuilds, but this time it had to go first. Now we can actually get to some body work. We're going to pull the closeout panel over the grill off, and we'll unbolt the top of our grill and unclip it. Little wiggle and pull. Now we're going to unbolt our wheel flares, wheel opening moldings, whatever you want to call them. And here's some of that carbon fiber wrap I told you we were going to be seeing more of. Turns out at one time this entire truck was wrapped with a carbon fiber wrap. It wasn't cheap, but since it is from Texas, at least it saved the paint. I don't know how long it was on there, but it was pretty brittle, so I would imagine it was probably on there for quite a while. 
We needed to take it off so that we could pull our filler out here. We're gonna unbolt the other side. Take our wheel opening molding off. Pull a little more of that carbon fiber wrap off. And we have an extra bolt on this side. Actually, it's not an extra. The other one was just missing one. Now we can pull this filler loose on the edge over here. And now we need to get our grill off of here. So we're gonna sneak underneath this filler and unbolt it. Requires an extension, a swivel, a shadow gnome with a light, and a lot of hope to get these bolts out of here. Really inconvenient to take it apart, but it's what we gotta do if we don't wanna break things. Do the other bolt on the outside, on the passenger side. There's four across the bottom. The HD trucks are much easier. And we dropped that bolt. It didn't fall into Narnia, it actually hit the ground, which is, as a mechanic, what you always hope for. Got our last bolt out of our grill, and our grill is ready to come off. And the filler stays with it for now. If you wondered what that sound in the background was, well, that's the haters' tears. They seem to be really coming down in this build. So I suspect that our haters' tears bottle is going to be pretty full at the end. So now that everything else is out of the way of our bumper, we're going to unbolt our bumper bracket. One bolt it from the bumper itself. And then we'll loosen up the bolts to the frame and just drop it down a little bit. Give ourselves some room to slide that bumper off. We're going to unplug our wiring harness to the front bumper for our fog lights and parking sensors. We'll try to unplug it. It's full of sand and everything else you find in Texas. Rattlesnakes. Cactuses. No rust. I'll take rattlesnakes and cactuses anyway. Tuck that off to the side. Now we can unbolt our four bolts that so hold it to the frame. And our bumper is ready to slide off. We're going to assist this from the Shadow Gnome. We're going to haul this over and swap over our bumper. Disassembling this bumper is much more involved than actually taking it off the truck. We'll have to unbolt this bumper valance, which is held on by about 30 screws, which is roughly five times the amount that holds the bumper on the truck. I guess the valance was more important than the bumper itself. So we got all those off of there. We'll pull our wiring harness off. And we'll unbolt our bumper bracket from the back of our bumper. Lift our bumper bracket out. Now we can start pulling the rest of the wiring harness off of our fog lights. Bunch of little Christmas tree style clips. Unbolt our fog lights. And a little bracket on the bottom. We're just going to take it all together. We'll do the same thing on the other side. Take our bumper bracket off. And take our fog lights off. Now we can start pulling our wiring harness off the rest of the bumper. We'll pop all of our parking sensors out of there. We're not going to unplug them. Pull out the little bezels for the tow hooks. And we'll unbolt our fancy foam piece on the bottom. It's actually more expensive than the bumper itself. Now we'll pop all the collars off for our parking sensors. They're just the clips that clip into the bumper, and then the parking sensors clip into them. We're only going to have to take three of them off. One of them was broken, so we got a new one, painted it up with the bumper. So we're going to take off the three that were still good. Just squeeze the tabs, push them out of there. And to put them back in, just line up the notches and use your bumper installation tool to hammer them in there. 
If you don't have a parking sensor bezel installation tool, it's okay. I don't either. And the next one in there. Third one. And our last one, which is our brand new one. Oh my gosh, he's doing this without gloves. How is he surviving? Now we're going to pull off all of our J-nuts, which apparently grow on trees at the GM plant because they use a lot of them. And if you've ever been taught, like me, to use a pick to pull the center out, slide them off, you're doing it wrong. Just take a, well, putty knife works best. But if you're lazy like me and want to walk back to the toolbox, you can use your trim clip pliers to slide them underneath that clip and pop them off. It's a lot easier than using a pick to try to get that ring up. Couldn't be simpler. But if change is scary and you like the pick method, go for it. I'm just sharing what works for me. And once we pull off our handful of clips, we'll clip them back on our bumper, hopefully in the right spots. And we'll pull our last few remaining ones off of our old bumper. Put them on our new bumper. Now we're ready to start putting our stuff back on our new bumper. We'll put this really expensive fake chrome piece on. Bolt that in. We'll put our wiring harness in complete with tow hook bezels. We bolt in our bezels. Start clipping in our wiring harness and our parking sensors. We can drop our fog lights in. Bolt those in. Clip in our wiring harness and plug those in. Now we're ready to set our bumper bracket in there. We'll bolt that down. And we'll do the fog light on the other side. In the case you couldn't tell, Clean Freaks, I cleaned absolutely none of these parts. Plug the harness in and set our bumper bracket in. We do start all the bolts before we run them all in there because if you tighten one up and it's in the wrong spot, none of the other bolts will line up. So I start them all by hand and then run them in with the impact to manufacture specs, of course. Now we can put our lower valance on. We'll start all of our screws. We're just gonna run them in a little bit, not tighten them up for the same reason. We might need to move it side to side to get all the bolt holes to line up. So once we have all our bolts started, we can tighten them all down. And then we got the specs, of course. The two in the end, go in the other way. And our bumper is fully assembled, ready to go back on the truck. So with a little help from the Shadow Gnome, we're gonna attempt to do that. We really only have to worry about the bumper brackets in the center. Since our other brackets, we loosen up from the frame and set them down a little bit. So we'll slide it on there. And we'll put a bolt on there so it doesn't end up on the floor. Because the last thing I want to do is tell the painting gnome the only part of this truck he had to paint. I dropped it on the floor and he has to paint it again. That never goes well. So we'll tighten up our bumper brackets. And hopefully the bumper's where it belongs. We'll knock all the cactuses and sand out of our plug, clip it back together, snap it in. It'll be ready to absorb the Illinois salt. Clip it back into our bumper. Now we can adjust our bumper brackets on the outside. We'll bolt them into the bumper, which actually happens to be in the right spot. We'll tighten up the outside. And we'll tighten it up to the frame. Do the same thing on the other side. The guy had the exposure all wrong. You'll have to take my word for it. That's what I was doing. Now we had the compressors off, so we can't use our assault riveter. So we're going to use our pump action riveter to rivet this little clip back on the top of our bumper. This holds that filler in to the center. A, it kind of makes a little rectangle hole and there's a clip on the bottom of the filler that slides right into that. Almost forgot this piece. And it's a little hard to put in after we put it all together. So now we're ready to put our grill on. We took the filler off the bottom of it so we can put it back together the way GM put it together. Just clips in, we'll bolt in the top of it. We'll get those four bolts on the bottom. 
nice and easy. Now we can put the pesky filler in. So I took the grill out because these little clips go on the back of the grill. This filler is really all you have to take out, but disengaging these clips, you end up breaking all these tabs. So if you take it out as an assembly, struggle a little bit, you can save every one of these clips and save this ridiculously expensive filler. So now to put it back together, it's much easier. So to put it back together, you just line up the tabs, smash it in with your bumper installation tool. Things are designed by engineers to go together at the factory. They don't care how difficult it is to take apart later. So sometimes you got to be creative to take it apart without breaking stuff. So now we'll throw our closeout panel on the top, push in all of our push pins. We can push our wheel opening moldings back in, put them back on. And we'll put our bolts back in our filler, both sides. I actually had to go find one from Scott's Enclave Emporium which happens to be the same. Now we're done with our front end. We're gonna fix our door lock. We're gonna pull the driver's door panel off, pull the little caps off so we can see the screws and the grab handle and the door handle. A couple screws on the bottom and then one hidden one behind this little trim piece. Most annoying piece of them all. We have to use an extension because it's way in there. The wiggle and pull and our door panel comes off. We'll disconnect the lock and the handle, unplug the wiring harness, and our door panel is off. We'll pull a little cap off, get the lock cover off, well, what's left of it anyway. Then we'll pull our handle back and slide that off of there, pull a little gasket off, and more of that carbon fiber wrap. Fill the rest of that off of there. Now we can unbolt the handle assembly from the inside of the door. It unclips in the back and then slides forward. Now we'll unbolt our grab handle bracket so we can pull our water barrier down. Now we can get the inside of our handle out. One clip the cables from it. However they come apart, I'm not picky. I don't seem to want to come apart anyway. We'll pop the cable out, take our handle back, and change over what we need to change. Looks like the lock is just punched out of it. So we have our used door lock assembly from Scott's GM Truck Emporium and our original. And an extra lock, courtesy of the mistake truck. So we're going to pop the clip out of it. I'm going to pull the screw out because it's in the way of the clip. Now we can slide our lock out of it. Put our clip back in because to put the lock back in, you just push it in. If you put the lock in there but not all the way, it makes it easier to slide that clip in. And we're missing some parts. So we're going to dismantle our old lock and hope we have enough tumblers or wafers, as I believe they're called on these, to make one complete lock. You can see our old one was busted off, so we were missing the front half of it. We just used our used lock, changed over the tumblers that we needed, and luckily we had enough to put it all back together. So we're going to slide everything back together. We put our little cover on the outside. There's a couple springs that hold it in. This is for the little door to keep debris out of it. Line it up and snap it in there. And there's a cap that goes over all of it that holds it together. It only goes on one way. So we need to line it up, snap it in, check it with our new key, make sure it works, and it does. So now to put it in our lock assembly, you just snap it in. We didn't actually need to use our entire lock assembly, just the actual lock itself. 
and we can clip our cables in. Snap them into our handle. Flip it into the door. And stuff this up in the door. This is easier if you take the window channel out, but I didn't feel like it. So I'm going to struggle. So I'm trying to get the rod from the door latch hooked into the back of our lock assembly. Takes a little bit of work, but luckily with my gross little fingers, I can get it done. And we didn't have to take the door apart to do it. So once it's in there, just slide the lock back, clip in the back, and we'll tighten up the front of it. Need to loosen up the screw first, so we can slide it all the way back. Clip in the back of it. Click. Now we're going to unbolt our door speaker and pop it out of there so we can see the bottom edge of our door. Because you didn't think I could take a GM truck door apart without cavity waxing the bottom of it, did you? And if you did, welcome to the channel. So we're going to throw our cavity wax in the bottom, keep this door seam looking good. Because being a Texas truck, it's already rust free and I want to keep it that way as long as possible. This will help do that. We'll throw our water barrier back up there. Stick it back to our door. We'll bolt in our grab handle bracket. Snap our speaker back in there. Bolt that in. Now with rust prevention complete, we'll throw our door handle back on there. We'll put our gasket in there. Slide the handle in. And we'll reach on the inside. Push the lever out and clip it in. And we'll slide our cap on the back and we'll screw that in there to hold everything together. Make sure it works, the handle and our lock, and we'll confuse the running board while we're at it. So now that our lock and handle are verified to be working, we'll put our door panel back on. We'll slide the window sweep out of there and all the clips for the top of our door panel. And we'll slide all the clips back on our door and install our window sweep. Now our door panel is ready to go on, so we'll connect our handle and our wiring harness. And we'll slide the lock in, line up the door panel, and smash it on our door. Once we got everything clipped in, we'll put our bolts back in, our grab handle, our handle, and our couple of clips across the bottom. Then we got that one that's behind our trim panel way down in there. So we use an old trick, putting a little piece of plastic in our socket and then stuffing the bolt in there to hold it in place while we line it up with the hole and tighten it up. Then you just take the socket off and let the piece of plastic, or paper, or whatever you use to hold it in there just fall down in the door. Or you can walk back to your toolbox and get one of those fancy magnetic sockets if you're rich and famous. I'm not. So now we need to do something about this ignition lock. So we're going to pull the cowling off of our steering column. The bottom we don't have to take off except for the fact that the last guy that was here didn't put the boot all the way back in. So we pulled that off. We'll turn the ignition lock to start, push the little pin on the top and a little wiggle and pull and our lock comes out. Of course our truck is running so we're going to turn it back off so we're not wasting gas trying to save the environment here. Now that our lock cylinder is out, we're back on our workbench slash tailgate. We'll push the pin out of there, we'll pull this collar off, keep the pin out, keep the collar off, and we're ready to start changing over our tumblers to rekey this lock. Wafers, whatever they're called. I'm going to take them out. I'm going to keep them organized. I don't know why. Maybe if I want to put the old lock back together in the right order. They are numbered. And hopefully I have enough from the leftover parts from Scott's GM Drug Emporium to make a lock that works. But since I had the ones from the door lock and they worked, I should be able to get the ignition lock to work. Actually, that doesn't even matter because who knows what they use for the ignition lock.
Well, I did have enough. I got all of our wafers back in there. So now it's time to put our lock back together. Slide the collar over there, make sure it turns. And I'll put our little button back in. This holds that other collar in and also holds that lock in the cylinder once it's all together. Snap it all together. Make sure everything rotates like it's supposed to. And we're ready to put it back in our truck. Since we shut our truck off to save gas, we have to put it back in the on mode. It's not going to start because we have no ignition lock. And we got it in there. It rotates, it turns like it's supposed to. So now we just have to program it. That's a long involved process that takes about 30 minutes. I'm sure there's plenty of YouTube videos and they will show you how to do that. I'm not going to. Now we'll wait for the first 10 minutes of our programming. We'll throw all the shrouding back on our steering column and get that back together. We have one key that does everything. Well, two keys, but they work all the locks on the truck. We programmed both of these keys. So now our truck starts and we're good to go. So let's keep doing some more stuff. So we pulled our passenger front door panel off, not just so that we can cavity wax it because I'm a freak about rust free vehicles, but because there was a dent on the outside of the door and we need our PDR guy to be able to get in here and pop that dent out and do his magic. So since we did that, we cavity waxed it while we were here. But why not? And our PDR guy was here. Our dent is completely gone. I can't tell you where it is other than maybe that clean spot. And now because I am a psycho, we pulled the other door panel off. Now we're gonna cavity wax the rear door. And now we're gonna do the other rear door. Maybe I put that other door panel on. Maybe I left it for the new buyer to put it back on. We'll never know because I didn't film it. If you need to see how those door panels come off and go on, you can watch one of my other many GM truck rebuilds where I've done this a million times. So while I was driving it, I noticed we have no GPS signal. Truck thinks we're still in Texas. Maybe it wishes it was still in Texas, but uh, it's back in Illinois, so we need it to know where it's at. Could be a bad antenna, pretty common on these, like we had on the steak truck, um, but I'm hoping that maybe the person that stole it might have disconnected the antenna as in an effort to keep OnStar or anybody else from finding it. So let's find out. So I decided to throw the scanner on it, and we do have that code right there. Satellite antenna is an open circuit. Maybe it is just unplugged. Let's find out. We'll just pull the headliner down in this corner and see what we see up there. It never fails. I buy a GM truck. I'm getting involved with the headliner. I don't know why it works out that way, but I wish it was something else. So we'll pull the little cover down so we can see the screws on the inside of the sun visor there. We'll unscrew the three screws. And there's one plug. We'll toss that in the back. We'll pull the little door down for the clip for the sun visor and the one screw in there. We'll pop the A-pillar trim off of there. We'll unbolt our grab handle and then rip it out of the roof. And we'll pull the headliner down and take a little peek up there. I can barely see. You definitely can't. Well, we didn't have any luck at the antenna that was plugged in, but if I remember correctly, there is a plug over here, so maybe they disconnected it down here. Uh, and it looks like somebody has been here before, so let's keep our fingers crossed. Save myself some money on an antenna. So you just pop the covers off, pull the bolts out, and our A-pillar trim comes off. So our windshield guy was also here, put our windshield in, and they didn't find anything that was disconnected from here to there. So we have from there to here to go. So I'm gonna put this back together because I'm tired of all this stuff hanging. Put the visor back in, put the console back up there, and then we'll pull the radio out. Hopefully something's disconnected in there. So we'll throw our sun visor back up, we'll clip in the wiring harness, and we'll bolt it back up. And if you're wondering why I'm showing all of this, well, if I have to struggle with headliners, you have to struggle watching it. So we'll screw that back up there. Screw in our clip. Close the little door. Now we'll clip the little plastic cover over the end of our sun visor to cover up all of our screws. It just snaps in there, if you can get it lined up. 
our visor in. We'll put our grab handle back up there. It snaps into the roof. Put our bolts in there, those little doors, and the handle folds up. And we'll put our overhead console in. I didn't show taking this out, so maybe it was already out before I got here because it wasn't on video. We'll just plug in the wiring harness and it snaps up into the roof. There's a couple of clips in the front. Gotta get them lined up. There you go. Clip those in. There's a couple of screws in the back. We'll tighten those up. Click. And then we can put the center piece up there. It just snaps in. We just took that down to see the screws in there. And we'll open the little sunglass holder to see if anybody left us a million dollars and we can retire. They didn't, so we're gonna keep working. We're gonna tear the keys out of the ignition so we stop the beeping sound to stop driving me crazy. And then we'll pull the bezel off around the radio and the HVAC controls. Just put a little 90 degree pick in the back of it, turn it, and then just a little wiggle and pull, pop it out of its clips. One more clip on the bottom. Okay, two. And I guess three. Now we'll set it down. And then bolt our radio. A little wiggle and pull. And our face comes out of there. And let's see what surprises await us. There's your problem, lady. We'll unplug it so you can see what I'm seeing. And there you go. We got one, two. This is concerning. They ripped it right out of there. Looks like they broke the tab. Yeah, they broke the tab off of it. If we can change this, this little plastic piece. If we can, that would be nice. But this one is a little more difficult. Why? So these are shielded cables. They're not wires. You can't just throw a buck connector in there and splice them back together. Hmm. No bueno. Well, this is part of... Yeah, this goes into that harness. It's part of this entire harness. I can't imagine that it is cheap. And since it's 2022, it might not even be available. Maybe Scott's GM Truck Emporium has something for us. Let's give him a call. So while we're waiting for that sarcastic jerk at Scott's GM Truck Emporium to finally answer the phone, we finally got our parts from GM for our transmission filter. So we're going to go ahead and change our fluid one more time. The fluid's a little bit cleaner this time since it's only been there for about 500 miles. You know how this goes. Pull all the bolts down. Pry the exhaust down, pull the pan out, make a mess on the floor, curse all the GM engineers, yada, yada, yada. This time we're actually going to pull the filter out. Hey, we're going to do a little cleaning. Clean freaks rejoice. I'm just going to get as much of this fluid out of the way as possible so it's not dripping on us. Genuine GM part. Must be Christmas. None of the aftermarket suppliers had this filter in stock, so I just went with GM. Just snap it up in there. A little gasket holds it in place. Now we're going to clean off our magnets. They're a little fuzzy, even after only being in there for 500 miles. So we'll clean off the magic transmission glitter that's on them and put them back in there to absorb more glitter. And while we're at it, we'll clean the rest of our pan off of there. 
Take our magnets back on our pan. And we'll reinstall it with a new gasket, which was actually what took the longest to get because GM told me they don't install new gaskets when they put the pan on. They reuse the old ones. Since this was our pan's third trip back up there, I decided it was probably better to wait for a new gasket than try to reuse the old one for a third time. So remember that the next time everybody thinks the dealer does everything perfectly. They reuse old gaskets. Not to say you can't, but, well, they are supposed to be one-time use. We'll get everything lined up. We don't have a shadow gnome to help us, but I think I can handle it myself. Then we'll bolt it all in. We'll even clean up some of the old oil off the crossover pipe. And now for my next beef with the GM engineers, they removed the dipstick because why would you need one? The hole is there and that's how you fill it. But unfortunately, we can't just pour it in. We have to use this little contraption. And no, that's not motor oil. It's just the bottle I had that fit the end. So I kept filling that up and pouring it in there. I'm not gonna bore you with how long that took. So instead, we're going to go over and we're going to cavity wax the rockers because, well, we want our rockers to remain there. And in Illinois, they won't last longer than six months if we don't put some wax in there. We pop the little caps off there that GM put in the bottom of our rockers just for this purpose. Why they didn't bother to put cavity wax in there before they put the caps back on? Well, that's an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Actually, it's not a mystery. I'll tell you why. They sell these trucks all over the country and it's not worth the time to cavity wax everything for the 50% of the vehicles that are going down south and will never be a problem. Not to mention the ones that stay up north and rot out. It gives you a reason to have to replace your vehicle because it's not a Ford and it isn't just going to die on its own. Now that our rockers are done, we're gonna go ahead and do our tailgate. We'll pull the cover off, just a bunch of torque screws, and we'll throw our wax down to the bottom seam. Lots of access in there. We'll throw our cover back on, line up all the screws, and tighten them all down. Now that we've done our rockers, our bedside, and our tailgate, we'll go ahead and do our fenders. We'll just go up over the wheel arches, on both sides, then we're gonna do our hood. Since we did our doors earlier, we've protected as much of this truck as we can from the Illinois rust. So the wire with the broken end goes right up here. I used an ohmmeter and just traced it from our broken end here to the top here. So Scott's Terrain Emporium had one. It's a little long, but what are you gonna do? It plugs into both ends, so I'm just gonna route this up there, connect the two, and hope everything works. So I'm going to pull these glove boxes out so we can see what we're doing in there. So to pull these glove boxes down, there's just a couple of Torx bolts in there, and then they unclip. Keep the bottom one off first, then the top one comes off. Now, you can see what we can see. Well, can't see that much. I can see enough. So now we're just going to try to route our wire in there. And for those people that are saying this is not the correct way to do this, you're right. I know. Changing the entire wiring harness, pulling the dash, replacing everything would be the way to do it. Unfortunately, that's way too expensive. It doesn't affect the build to put this in there. So we're going to go ahead and do this and save ourselves and the new buyer a bunch of money. Now that we're done with our wiring hack, we can plug it all in. While we're here, I guess we can check the cabin air filter. But he's been here before. Woo! It needs one. I'm gonna get it out of here and I can tell you it's dirty. So I just tucked the extra wire up here, coiled it up and stuffed it in there so it won't rattle around. And we'll just push this end off to the side. And the next guy that pulls his radio out is gonna be like, what the? Somebody's been here before. It's me. 
I finally get to be that somebody. You have no idea how long I've waited to be that somebody. The next guy's gonna take it apart, not understand the story, and wonder what was going on there. But if they take the time to figure it out, I think they'll understand why I went with the method I did. I'm so confident. I can plug this in. Hey, we're in Lamont. We're not missing our GPS signal. Success. So we plugged in our heated seat and ventilated seat controls. We'll stuff those wires in there. Then we'll push this bezel back in. Line up all the tabs. And it just snaps right in. And we'll give a little pat on the head. Now we're going to put this trim panel back up in the front. Put our daylight sensor in there. We had to head this out so we could see our wiring harness up there. There's a little junction block where all the wires go together. That's where we took it apart at. It slides up underneath the windshield. If I had taken this apart when the windshield was out, this would have been a lot easier. We'll clip it into the dash. We'll put our eight pillar trims back in. Pull our gasket out around our A-pillar trim. Then head over to the passenger side. Slide that into the dash. This one has a grab handle on it. Snap it in. Bolt in the grab handle. Put our little covers back on. Make sure the grab handle's working. And now we're going to change that cabin filter. It was so dirty. Now we've got a little trick here. We'll pull our new cabin filter out of the box, and we're going to tear up the box. Not to make it fit easier in the garbage, but if we take one piece of this box out, the flat piece, we're going to slip it in underneath our old cabin filter. That way, as we pull our cabin filter out and all the junk that's on the top falls down, it'll fall down on our cardboard and not into our blower motor. We do this when you can see a lot of junk on top of the cabin filter. It saves you from having to drop the blower motor or having debris rattling around in there when you're done. So we slip it underneath our old filter. We're going to slide our filter out of there and hold the cardboard in. Then we got all kinds of tree parts and dirt and everything else. It was time. Now we can pull our cardboard out of there. It's hopefully holding the rest of our tree parts in the pile. Now we can pull our new cabin filter out of its little bag. Make sure we got it going in the right direction and slide it in there. Flip our little door on after we clean all the junk off of it. Clips in on the bottom, snaps in on the top. Now we're ready to put our glove boxes back in. we we'll put the top one in first and clip it in. Then we can put our bottom one in, clip that in. Then we can start putting all of our screws back in. Make sure they still open and close. Got to program our new fob. So we just plugged our scanner in. We're going to select the right function in whatever module we need to program. Get to our program mode. We'll hold the lock and unlock button until it beeps, lets us know it's programmed. We did one. Now we're going to do the other. I cleared them both out. Start over. When that one's set, we should be done. We only have two fobs. Test them and make sure they work. Alright. Two working fobs. That was easy. Our truck is all detailed up. The detailing gnome was here, got it all cleaned up, which is actually all I thought I was going to have to do when I bought this truck, was just give it a nice detail, clean it up, and send it on down the road. I was not really expecting the front struts, 
the transmission issues, GPS issues, anything like that. But there's a reason I always figure extra money into my rebuilds because, well, there's stuff like that that you could inspect it at the auction and still miss. Always figure in extra money to any of your rebuilds, even if you don't see them in person, and I didn't see this in person. Even if I did, would I have figured in all of that stuff? Absolutely not. So I would have been behind because I might have spent more money on it. Now, this truck, I bought it. I didn't have a buyer for it. I figured I'd sneak it up on my website and see how many stalkers are out there. Well, apparently there was at least one because somebody stalking my website saw this thing and went and purchased it before I even put these videos up. So this one's already gone. But if you want to know what I sold it for, head on over to my website and you can see. And you can see a few more details and a few more pictures. So thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one. We already played What's in My Console. I don't ever smoke up, no I don't take sh I got no love for the fakeness If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this I'll always show up and make a statement I don't ever smoke up, no I don't take sh I got no love for the fakeness If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this I'll always show up and make a statement